Amen. Well, this morning, I'm excited about what I've got to share with you. The Lord, uh, a few weeks ago, the Lord began to stir my heart. Uh, for 10 weeks, we've been following a theme called Discovering God Through Personal Encounters that Jesus had with individuals. And we covered 10 different individuals in the New Testament. Two weeks ago, uh, we talked about discovering God, the Holy Spirit. This morning, I want to talk about discovering the amazing grace of God. Oh, man, there's nothing like it. And for, for weeks now, the Lord's been stirring my heart on this theme. And I'm going to talk about what's so amazing about grace. And it is amazing. A guy by the name of Philip Yancey, uh, back around um, 1997, 2000, somewhere along in there, wrote a book, What's So Amazing About Grace. Maybe you've read the book. It's, it's a good book, got a lot of good stuff in it. But uh, this morning, I want to talk to you. And, and I said to the Lord a couple of weeks ago, I said, Lord, why do you want me to teach on grace at Oak Grove? I, I know grace. I know what John Wesley taught about grace, the prevenient grace of God, the saving grace of God, the sanctifying grace of God, the glorifying grace of God. I, but why do you want me to teach on grace at Oak Grove? And I felt like he said this in my heart. I didn't hear an audible voice. Uh, I've never had that happen. I've never heard God speak with an audible voice, but he speaks. And he spoke to me in my heart. And I felt like he said this, look around. Just look around. There's so many hurting people that don't understand the grace of God. They're, they're, and, and, and even look at Christians. There's so many Christians who, who are, are uh, just in knots instead of living by faith and living in victory and more than conquerors. So just look around. And uh, I felt like you said, look, look at the fact that there are some that are discouraged, despondent. Some, look at how many have a father wound that they're trying to deal with in life and don't know how to handle the issues of life. So uh, three passages of scripture. Ephesians chapter two is where we're going to launch this morning. And then if you'd find Romans 3 and just put a marker there, and then you can find Romans 11 pretty easy from there. But those are three primary scriptures I want to zero in on this morning. And uh, I, I want to I want to start by giving you a definition of grace. And I want you to maybe write this down. It might be helpful for you. Grace is the unmerited, undeserved unearned kindness and favor of God. I'm going to say it again. Grace is the unmerited, undeserved, unearned kindness and favor of God. I want you to read it with me. I want you to get this. I want to drill it into us this morning. Grace is the unmerited, undeserved, unearned kindness and favor of God. I have a good friend who is a wonderful Christian, but I don't think he understands grace. He's a guy who studies the word. But I remember one guy said to me one time talking about grace, he said, grace is like the oars of a boat. He said, we're in the boat and there's a current that's pulling us toward hell and God's provided these oars. And he said, that's grace. And then he went on to say, if we keep rowing, we'll get to heaven. That's the way he thought about grace. But if you ever quit rowing, he said, you're going to go to hell. Let me tell you something. That's not amazing grace. That's amazing you. And you ain't that amazing. Grace is the undeserved, unmerited, unearned love, kindness, and favor of God that we're recipients of. So I want to unpack those three words and just zero in on them this morning. One of the, by the way, uh, another pastor that I know said he contacted 
a hundred different pastors and he's asked them the question, what is grace? And he said this, 90% of them responded back and said the traditional answer, it's the unmerited favor of God, which is a pretty good definition. But he said there was a few of the churches that wrote back, pastors that wrote back and said it's divine enablement. And that's making the circles today in the church world that grace is divine enablement. Let me tell you something, that's not what grace is, that's what grace does. And there's a tremendous difference. Grace does, one of the things it does is enable us to live and walk with Christ. But that's not what grace is. That's what grace does. And if you can grab this this morning, it will set you so free in your walk with God. Grace is the unmerited, undeserved, unearned kindness of God. Listen, it's not your rowing that's going to get you to heaven. When you step into heaven and you're there and you're not going to boast and say, I'm here because I've been rowing. And look around, my friends that didn't keep rowing, they're not, listen, you see Jesus and see the nail prints in his hands. That's the first time you're going to say, that's grace. His, his blood is what got me here. It wasn't my rowing that got me here. So, grace. Oh, I'm excited about this. Move us on. I'm hung up here. Give me the next slide. And I hope you can see this. I, I tried to fancy it up a little this morning. Uh, grace, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It's, it's the unmerited kindness and favor of God. Now look at it. He says, for by grace... You have been saved. Now notice the word, you have been saved. I'll talk more about that next week. Past tense. You have been saved. There's an ED. You have been justified. You have been forgiven. You have been set free. It's past tense. Write it down. It's undeserved. It's unmerited. But it's done. Jesus said it's finished it's finished and so there is a past tense to my salvation i don't have to go back every day and wonder did it happen i know it happened october the 31st 1966 god for christ's sake wiped away every sin wrote my name in the book of life it's a deal that's been already cut with god it's done it's unmerited oh my i didn't earn it I just believed for it, and I got it. Oh, isn't that good? Woo! I, uh, wow. It, by grace are you saved. Not your rowing. It's by grace that you're saved. Not of works, lest any man should boast. It's the gift of God. It's God's gift. Mm. Woo! Oh, just, just, just feast on that a minute. It's done. The great transaction's done. He is my Lord and I followed on, but it's done. Whew. By grace, by grace. Now notice, let me just say it this way. Jesus plus nothing Jesus minus nothing equals salvation. It's all Jesus. It's all Jesus. And here's the, here's the thing that's so amazing. When I first got saved, I didn't have any trouble believing that. But after 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, I've been preaching now. I think, oh, I must be doing something pretty good now. I'm earning something. No, sir. All of my righteousness is as dirty, filthy garage rags as far as earning my salvation. It's not our preaching. It's not our teaching. It's nothing that we have done. It's all Jesus. By grace you're saved through the gift of God that's given to you. Oh, I like it. 
Galatians chapter 2 gets even more plain. Paul says, I do not set aside, get this, the key, old King James says, I don't frustrate the grace of God. I don't set it aside uh, for if righteousness comes through the law, get this, then Christ died in vain. And, and, and the NIV makes it real plain. The NIV says, I don't set aside the grace of God for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. If you could row and get there, Jesus wouldn't have had to have died. Right. It's by grace alone, yes. through faith alone. Hallelujah. Even our righteousness hmm, won't cut it. So that's the first thing. Second thing. Go ahead and move me forward. It's undeserved. Romans 3, verse 24. And this is such a powerful verse. Even though, listen, you didn't deserve it when you got saved and you don't deserve it now. It's still of grace now. Don't miss that. We kind of get puffed up sometimes after we walk with the Lord for a while and say, Lord, look what I'm doing for you. No, 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 no. It's still by grace. It's all by grace, faith in Christ. I didn't deserve it in 1966. I don't deserve it now. Romans 3, 24. Being justified freely, and I've written in my notes, undeservedly by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Look, we are not bought with silver and gold, but we've been bought. We've been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to put a word in here, so maybe make it a little, little plainer for us. He said, being justified freely. Let me, let me take out the word well, I'll do something else. Let me do something else first. I'm going to put a word up so you can see it and talk to you about how this is spelled, in how, it put, how it's in the Greek. So go ahead and put the next slide up for me. Grace, the, the word Greek word is charis, C-H-A-R-I-S. And that's, that's the word grace. Now, uh, in the Greek, it's not pronounced charis. The C is silent, and the I sounds like a long E in the Greek. In the Greek, it's pronounced haris, and the R is kind of rolling. I can't do that real well, but that's the way it is in the Greek. It's the word haris. Uh, now, I'm not suggesting that we, uh, a lot of girls have been named Charis, because it's a beautiful name, and it means the grace of God. Now, I'm not suggesting you, if you had know somebody that's named Grace, that you walk up to them and say, Haris, how are you? <laughs> I'm not suggesting that at all. Uh, in fact, I, I, have a, I have a friend who uh, wanted to name his daughter Caris, Car Caris. And uh, uh, another friend said to him, I don't think that's a good idea. He said, well, why? It's a beautiful name. He said, your last name is Maddox. Think about it. Karis Maddox? <laughs> Can you imagine a girl uh, having to deal with that in life? So I'm not suggesting that you call Karis Haris, but that's the word in the Greek. Now, and the reason I, I wanted to share that with you, let me talk to you a little bit about the word haris and how it was used culturally before it became a scriptural word. Before, uh, and the Holy Spirit chose this word, it, it implied it referred to a benevolent gift, now listen to me, from a superior to an inferior. That's always what it meant in the culture. When someone superior in wealth or in goods saw someone who was in need or inferior, not as a person, but inferior in goods, then the superior gave a gift to that inferior person in that area of goods. Then it was called grace. It was haris. But it involves, now listen, you might, this might shock you, it actually involved three parties. You would think it maybe just involved two, the person giving and the person receiving. But in the Greek, and these were the closest English words to the Greek, there were three words I want you to get. There was the patron, 
who was involved. That was the person who provided the gift. And then there was the person who received the goods. He was called the client. This is what it was culturally before it became a Bible word for us. Now, again, I don't think these are words that we need to use when we talk about the gospel, like clients and patrons like that. I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying that in the culture, uh, these were the meanings of the word in Jesus' day. So the patron, let's put it this way, maybe the patron owned a shoe store and he wants to provide some children in an orphanage, they're the clients. But who's the third person? In every transaction, there was a third person. This again is the closest word in the Greek. He was called the broker. The broker would go out into the community and see the needs of an inferior and bring the inferior and the superior together. Here's something else. The broker actually would pay for the merchandise. If it was 20 pair of shoes, he paid for the shoes. The patron provided it, the clients received it, but the broker paid for it. Does that sound familiar? Yes, the broker is Jesus. He brought us together with the Father, but he paid the debt fully. It's Jesus who becomes the broker that brings us together. So it's, grace is unmerited. It's undeserved. And here's the third word. Romans chapter 11, verse 6. It's unearned. And if by grace, then it's no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. And if it's works, it's no longer grace. Otherwise, it's no longer work. In other words, it can't be both. It has to be one or the other. If it's grace, it's no longer works. If it's works, it's no longer grace. And if you try to add works to grace, then you spoil the whole deal and it doesn't work. That's why Paul wrote to the Galatians and said, I'm worried about you. I'm afraid that you are backsliding. You're going back to works. And it's by grace through faith that you get saved. We need to hear that message in our day. Amen. We must hear it. It's by grace. And if it's by grace, it's no longer of works. That's what he's saying. If it was paid for, it's no longer a gift. I mean, if I had to buy it, it's not a gift any longer. You never got a, a you, you never got a birthday gift and going out the door turned around and said thank you and they said that'd be a dollar three eighty three. <laughs> it's no longer a gift if you pay for it. If your rowing can pay for it, it's no longer a gift. It's by grace and grace alone. Grace does give us divine enablement to live out the life, but it's not my enabling that gets me to heaven. It's his victory that I choose to believe in and put my faith, my trust, my hope in. Grace, oh, grace, marvelous grace. Are you a recipient of grace? Let me give you a different definition. This just blows my mind. When I started studying, I started looking in some of my books and uh, some of the programs on my computer, and I come across this definition of grace. And man, it just is so full. It comes from a Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible. Grace, get this, is the dimension of divine activity that enables... <laughs> God, can you think about that? Something enabling God. Grace is the dimension of divine activity that enables God to be just and be a justifier of the unjust. All of that's packaged in that. Grace is the dimension of divine activity that enables God to confront human indifference and rebellion Get this, with an unexhaustible capacity to forgive and to bless. It's inexhaustible. Listen, the, the Bible says, give me the next, 
John 1.16, for of his fullness we all have received. Get this, and grace, picture grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. It's unlimited. It ain't going to run out. It's unlimited. I think about that. I think about the missionary who was in our church one time in Michigan named John Kunkel. John had come home from a mission field. He, he and his family were with World Gospel Mission back in those days. And they had been on a, a mission assignment. I can't remember where the country was, but water was scarce in the place where the mission compound was. And, uh, you know, it was so precious. They had to haul their water. Drinking water had to be prepared well. And so John was just so so worked up about water when he came to Michigan and his little boy was just enamored with the bathroom. He had never seen anything like this was quite a few years ago, but his boy had never seen you go and turn a faucet on and the water, whoosh, and he flushed a commode, flush a commode, flush a commode. And John just was getting so worked up. He said, boy, quit wasting that water. You can't do that. And the owner of the house said, John, listen to me. All of Lake Michigan is behind that faucet. Leave that boy alone. He's not going to run it dry. Amen. All of heaven is behind the grace of God. It's grace upon grace. And we can come to the throne of grace and find grace and mercy to help us in the time of need because of the grace of God. Oh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Well, give me the next slide. All of the epistles, and I'm going to just run through these quickly. All of the 13 epistles of the Apostle Paul, letters, that's what the word epistle means, begin and end with grace. And I saw this this week. All 13 of the books that Paul wrote, let me go through them. Romans 1, 5. Through him we've received grace. Romans 16. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Next slide. Just roll them for me. 1 Corinthians 1, 3. Grace to you and peace from God and the Father of our Lord Jesus. 1 Corinthians 16. The, wait a minute. Back up. The grace of the, I'm not that fast. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. Second letter, grace to you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and love of God, communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go ahead. Galatians 1, he writes to the Galatians and he said, I just need to remind you of God's grace. Grace to you. Galatians 6, after he spent all of those wonderful instructions about grace, he said, now look, the grace of the Lord Jesus it's going to be with your spirit. Ephesians 1, 2, he says, I greet you in Ephesus with the grace of God. Grace to you and grace be with you all, those who love our Lord Jesus. Philippians 1, grace to you. Philippians 4, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Colossians 1, grace to you and grace be with you. And then he writes to his uh, Thessalonians Church, grace to you. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. Grace to you. The second letter, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And then he writes to his preacher boy, Timothy, and he said, Timmy, listen, grace, mercy, and peace comes from God the Father through Jesus our Lord. Timothy, grace be with you. Grace, Timothy, mercy, and peace. And in the fourth letter, a fourth chapter, he says again to him, grace be with you. He writes to Titus and says, grace, mercy, and peace. Grace be with you all. To Philemon, he writes, verse 3, it says, grace to you. Verse 25, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. From the first to the last, Everything he says is encircled and bookended with grace. I'm surrounded this morning by grace. My faith, my walk with God has been bookended by grace. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, goodness gracious. Oh, 
It is grace. Hallelujah. I'm going to get there, but not by my rowing. That's it. That's it. Because of his grace. I started with grace. I'll finish Amen. with grace. Whew. Now, now I want to show you a picture of grace. In just a minute, I'll need you to move that slide for me, but I don't want you to do it just yet. I need to tell you a little bit about these two individuals that you see here. Those are, the fellow's name is Rick Hoyt. That's the boy. The father's name is Dick. Rick was born with umbilical cord around his neck and the oxygen was cut off from his brain for quite a while and because of it, he was never able to walk or to talk. But they found out that as he was growing up, as he was maturing, that he was extremely intelligent because they could watch his eyes and, and he could move his eyes and he began to communicate. His mom, Judy and Dick, they began to teach him and his father and mother taught him the alphabet, even though he couldn't talk, with just using his eyes. This was in 1973. Now think about that, the technology back then. They gathered together, Dick and Judy, gathered together a group of engineers and paid for it themselves and invented a computer for him where he could move a cursor with his eyes and highlight certain letters and bump something on a computer, something like a mouse in those days. And through the computer, for the first time, he learned to speak some words. That technology, of course, has been advanced and it's used now around the world. But it was invented for this young man. When he was 15, one of his classmates was in an accident where he was paralyzed. The classmate was paralyzed and they were going to run a 5K race to run money for him, to raise some money for him. And Rick, the little boy, through the computer, tapped ladders out to his dad and said, Dad, I want to run in that race. So his dad, not a runner, not trained, so he could push his son in a wheelchair in that race. He put a hundred pound sack of concrete in a wheelchair and began to train and push that wheelchair so he could push his son in a 5K race. After the race, Rick said to his dad, Dad, that's the first time in my life that I haven't felt handicapped. And so his dad continued to train now they've run in 72 marathons and 255 triathlons. A triathlon, if you don't know, is 2.4 miles of swimming, 26.2 miles of running, and 112 miles of biking. When Dick swims, Rick is pulled by Dick in a little raft. When Dick cycles, Rick's placed on the handlebars in a seat that's been specially built for him on the bicycle. When Dick runs, Rick's in the chair and Dick's pushing him. I want to show you a picture of grace. Don't ever forget it. Go ahead. Could be some sound. 